want to preach uh, today a message, and I want to begin by uh, addressing the fact that there are people in the room today who feel very much like things are out of control in your life today. And if that's you, uh, I understand what that feels like. If you feel like I'm, I'm just I'm hanging on here by a thread, because life and trials and all your responsibilities feel like they're stacking up like a game of Tetris that you've lost control of, and it's stacking up, and it's all like, you're like, it's over my head here. And when you're in those moments, it can feel like you're swimming with one arm tied behind your back. And if that's you today, I'm glad you're here. I believe God's going to bless you, but I'm not preaching for you today. This message is not for you. So you hang on to all your issues. There's going to be a future week where we're going to talk all about that. Today, I want to talk to those who feel like life's going pretty good right now. And you're not bragging when you say that. It's always a weird thing, right? Like if I said, hey, who's hurting today? I mean, there would be so many people raising their hands up. I've done it for years. I've been that person for years. And let's be clear. This church is a safe place for people who are hurting. We're glad you're here. If your life's on fire today, but you're still here, you barely showed up, but you're here. We welcome you at this church. We're glad you're here. If you barely got any faith to rub together. But oftentimes in the church, we, we, we just talk about the hurting people. We forget about the people who are doing well. And it's funny, if I said, who's doing really good today, most of you would not raise your hand up because you'd be like half afraid you jinx it or something like that. You don't even know if you should believe in that, but you, you feel like maybe you'd be proud if you did and God would like throw a lightning bolt at you, right? Like the knock on wood kind of thing. You're like, I can't say I'm doing good. But let me just throw this out there. What's the point of all that God's calling us to do and get victory in and get growth in and strength in if there couldn't be uh, the possibility of brighter horizons? So proof of concept, uh, I'm really grateful today to thank God that I'm at a really good spot in my life right now. And I'm really grateful uh, to see victory in so many areas, blessing in so many ways. And I came today to preach specifically to those of you who would say, like, you know, it's like emotionally I'm feeling pretty healthy. It's not always been the case. Believe me, there was, there was times where I couldn't travel with carry-on luggage. I needed room for all my baggage, OK? I, I, I understand. I get it if you're like, no, nah, emotionally I'm a mess. But, but if you're at a place where you're like, you know what, done some work, grown, feel more grounded, I feel more my true whole healed self. I'm doing pretty good. My kids, man, praise God. My friendship with my kids is doing good. If you would say today the marriage is not, not perfect, but man, I'm really, really, really blessed and grateful and thankful for, for how my marriage is doing right now. And, and maybe you would you know, keep going and talk about a bonus at work that you're proud of getting because you worked your butt off to get it and you've seen the business grow and you've, 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 you've you know, paid your dues to some degree and had, had to swallow some and take some stuff on the chin. And, and, but you've gotten to a place where you're proud of the progress you've made. There's room for that. The Bible talks about ants being so smart because they lay up in summer what they get to enjoy in winter. You know what it feels like to have a super huge need in winter and be like, oh my gosh, I've got the perfect store of that hidden in my anthill. It feels good, <laughs> right? It's a wonderful thing to get to seven years of famine and to be Joseph and go, you know what's amazing is we spent the last seven years storing stuff up. Let's break into that, shall we? Anybody? <laughs> Let's pop a cork and have some grain. It's good, right? So, so if, if you're at a place today where you would go, I'm, I'm walking in God's favor. I'm, as one pastor put it, because I'm following Jesus, I'm not just experiencing a better life. I'm actually getting better at life, which is wonderful. Then praise God for it. And this sermon, I preach for you. The title of this message I can't handle this. I can't handle this. I'm going to make you a promise. By the end of the sermon, I'm going to teach you a prayer that's probably the most important prayer, but one that you probably wouldn't think of to pray in times of prosperity, in times of blessing. And I want to teach you so that you understand what to do for some of you who are not in a good season for what you can do when you get to one in Jesus' name. 
Because our God opens up doors that no one can shut. And he can make a way where there is no way. And by God's grace, you will get to better days. You will move through your valleys. You will get to greater glory and blessing. And I want to teach you so you have it in the tank, because you've got to train for the trial you're not yet in. So if you're like up to your eyeballs in debt, and your marriage is not good, and your relationship with your kids is a dumpster fire, and you're barely hanging on to your, the job that you have, and you're emotionally a mess and a child in an adult's body, I'm going to teach you so that when that day comes and you look up and you go, you know what? Life's kind of rad right now in Jesus' name. Here's what you're going to do. You're going to pray the prayer that I'm going to give you by the end of this message, all right? But before we go any further, say it out loud with me. Say, I can't handle this. And you got to, you got to, your, your wrists, if your wrists aren't snapping, you're doing it wrong. I can't handle this. I can't handle this. Mark chapter 3, here's what we find. I love this passage. It says, and he entered the synagogue again. And he, Jesus, entered the synagogue, church, again. If you underline stuff in your Bible, I would underline the word again, because it's significant. And he, Jesus, entered the synagogue again. And a man was there who had a withered hand. So they watched him, Jesus, closely, whether he would heal him on the Sabbath so that they might accuse him. And he, Jesus, said to the man, the one with the withered hand, step forward. Then he said to them, is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do evil? So he's got the man in the center of their gathering. And with the man standing there, he says, come forward, step forward. And with the man standing there, knowing they were watching him, to see what he would do for this man, he now calls them out on the thoughts they had silently been thinking. Houston, we got a mind reader. He said to them, is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do evil, to save life or to kill? You know, I wouldn't ever recommend you play chess with Jesus. <laughs> He's thinking 17 moves ahead. So they think they got him in a trap. They think they got him in this big aha moment. He's going to heal this man, which is work. He's the Messiah. He's going to work and do some miracle, touch the guy, do something to heal this guy. And then they're going to be like, busted. And Jesus addresses their thinking. What's the purpose of the Sabbath? What's it there for? Is the Sabbath given to take life or to give life? They kept silent. <laughs> they were like, oh, steam started coming out of their ears. Because <laughs> if they say it's to give life and to help and to do good, if, if Sabbath was given for man and not man for the Sabbath, then the thing they're going to bust him for, they can't bust him for. Right. But if they go, well, the Sabbath was given for evil, then they're insinuating that God's a sinner. And God gave it for an evil purpose. And that taking life is preferable to giving it. So they all just look at their feet. <laughs> and when he had looked around at them with anger, being grieved by the hardness of their hearts, he said to the man, stretch out your hand. And he stretched it out. And his hand was restored as whole as the other. Then the Pharisees went out and immediately plotted with the Herodians against him how they might destroy him. What do Jimi Hendrix, Albert Einstein, LeBron James, Marie Curie, 
Benjamin Franklin and Nikolai Tesla have in common? They're all ambidextrous. They can equally and effortlessly utilize both the right and the left hand, and there's no diminishment. There's no, I can, I can work it out. I can muscle it out. I can figure it out. There's no sense in the brain of like, this is funny. This is strange. I'm dominant in my left brain, but I'm using my right hand. I'm dominant in my right brain. I'm using my left hand. I can, I can do it eventually, but ugh, right? Only 1% of the American population, studies have found, are truly ambidextrous. Some can, can better get by with their non-dominant hand, but to be truly where it's exactly the same in your brain and in your hand, using your right hand or your left hand. Any truly ambidextrous people in the church today, in the gathering today? Yeah, not, okay, well, come on now, welcome, welcome. We're glad you're here, look at that. That's pretty good, right? 1% of the population, truly ambidextrous. Um, but it's not the only... That's not the only way that you can be different than just right-hand dominant or left-hand dominant. Um, there's also, I, I came across this in my research this week. This was fascinating to me. There's a condition that's the opposite of being ambidextrous, where both hands feel as foreign to your brain as a dominant right-hand person does using their left hand. That's just sad. I'm just, I'm just I thought, I was like, that's so mean. Like, it, that's, <laughs> That's terrible. That's, that's not good. Um, last week, we talked about uh, how God has a plan for our left hands. We talked about how all of us have a left hand, right? And all of us have an area of our life where we feel left-handed. And I'm not just talking about the South Paws among us who say, man, I'm a, I'm a lefty living in a right-handed world. And writing on a notebook is annoying, and dry erase is annoying, chalks, and all, because everything's just kind of built, like even the flaps on our jeans are built for a right-handed person. You have to go over the flap with your left hand to, to zip up your pants in the morning. But similarly, there's a, a, a way in which we all feel like we have our own kind of left-handed issue, where we don't kind of fit in. Something may be different about us. We're shorter, or, you know, we're, we, we love running, or we're, we're, we're nerdy. There's, all of us have a, you know, if we could change something about us, maybe we would change that. And what we discovered is when we look through God's glasses at our left hand, we see in his perspective, he's like, it's actually a source of power. What you would deem a source of weakness, your left hand, is in his estimation something that makes you super strong and capable and able. This week, we're going to see the other side of it as we talk about the right hand. How does God see the right hand? How does God want us to see the right hand? Which, in scripture, is a picture of power, authority, blessing. It's not the seven skinny years. It's the seven powerful years, seven blessed years. Seven years of abundance. Paul said, I know how to use my left hand. I know how to use my right hand. 2021, we made our staff theme for us here at Fresh Life Church, uh, ambidextrousness. We talked about coming to a place as a church, com coming out of COVID, where we weren't going to say, well, I'm only going to do online or I'm only going to do in person. Could we do both? Could we reach both? Could we minister in such a way that would allow this message to go into all the world and reach countries around the world and prisons around the world and people around the world with the gospel and also be a church that prioritizes and cares about what can happen in the gathering? And there's always going to be some pushing for, for one or the other, but can we, be, can we have kind of a spiritual ambidextrousness? Well, in the wounds of Jesus, we find healing, not just for our left hands, but for our right hands also. In fact, uh, John's gospel tells us there at Skull Hill, they crucified him. Nails through both of his palms. Nails through both of his, his physical hands, the hands that were in Mary's womb, the hands that, that grew up, the hands that, 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 that touched the leper. Those same hands were stretched out and pierced. And Isaiah the prophet said it was for us. It was for you. It was for me. We can internalize that. It was for me that he was wounded. It was for me that he was punctured, that he was pierced. And there's healing for us. Oh, yeah, salvation. Don't have to go to hell. That's awesome. Just the beginning. Just the beginning. The freedom, the, the, the strength, the peace, the rightness, the wholeness. God has wholeness 
for, for your life from his wounds, Isaiah says. Okay? So insecurities is where we talked about last week, but now I want to talk about the other side of it, the right hand of, of strength and power. The Bible understandably has a lot to say about God's right hand. There are no verses that I can find in the entire Bible about God's left hand. You want to know why? He doesn't have one in that he doesn't have weakness. He has no rival. He has no equal. Psalm 89 verse 13 says, you have a mighty arm, strong is your hand, and high is your right hand. Now, of course, we're using anthropomorphism now. For God the Father is not flesh and blood. He's, he's not a man. He's, 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 he's spirit. He dwells in unapproachable light. But in the person of Jesus, of course, he did come. And in the person of Jesus, he came not as a lion. He came as a lamb. He came sort of as left-handed, born in a podunk city with no connections, no reason. You're like, I, I'm from a small town. He's from a smaller one, OK? Well, I, I didn't come from much. He was born in a cave. You think you have complications and difficulties from your origin story? His was worse and his was weirder so that he could truly relate to us no matter what we go through. We have a high priest, you hear me, who can sympathize you with you in all of your weaknesses. Well, you don't understand, I've, lo I've lost a loved one. His cousin was beheaded. You see, there's nothing you can go through that Jesus doesn't put his left hand on yours and say, I get it. And my father and I have a plan to turn your left hand into a weapon if you let him. But what about your right hand? What about your good days? What about the areas of blessing and strength and progress and growth? And what about the fact that you, you can accomplish something for, for God? What about the fact that some of you today are on fire for God? That's a right hand. That's a right hand. Come on, if you're not struggling with the same things you used to struggle with because you've put away childish things and you've grown up and learned to be a spiritual adult in Jesus' name, you got a right hand too. We can't just be people who can be abased only, only good in crisis, only good for the battle. What about, what about, what about the banquet? What about when we get pulled out of the pit like Joseph and now we're in the palace? Do we got faith for the palace? Do we got faith for the boardroom? Do you got faith for the six-figure bonus checks? Or can you only trust in God when you're hand to mouth? Can you, like the ant, lead well, steward well, get out of debt, get your finances in order, start giving, start growing, start scaling, be an employer, have a different culture? Can you change the paradigm for your family and generational for, for multiple different levels and strata? Do you have faith for righteousness to spill out? Or are you just going to struggle till you die? Can we be a people who can handle blessing and not just barren times? We need to figure out how to worship God with our right hand. Now, interestingly enough, in the culture in which the scriptures were given and written, it was not only preferable to be right-handed, it was actually viewed as unclean to do anything with your left hand. Because the right hand was what was used for both eating and greeting gift giving and blessing in a culture that was all about those things. The Middle Eastern culture, then now, all about hospitality, all about the, the power to confer blessing, right? All about greeting, the holy kiss, right? Conferring upon gifts and anointing. Paul talked about what he did to Timothy in laying on his hands for him. The book of Galatians describes someone new to the church being given the right hand of fellowship. What is that? Someone's saying, hey, I've been here for a while. I'm a right hand in this church. And guess what? We're glad you're here. I hope if you're new that you don't just find this church cold and everyone's telling inside jokes and laughing about how good their small group is. Well, is there a room? No, nope, we've been closed for a while. That we would be a church that says, hey, you're new here? Let me tell you who, who I am. Let me tell you that, that you're welcome here. Let me tell you some of those old jokes. Let me scoot over on the bench and make room for you. Hey, here's where we keep the jerseys. There's room for you on this team. This is a brand new season. We've never been here before. Oh, you, you've been here for so long. You're all crotchety and salty and territorial and small-minded. Move over. Let's make room for some new people to start serving. Let's make room for some new people to get in on this. We, we got to be people offering that right hand. We got to have a right hand to offer it. Right hand of fellowship, both eating, meals, hospitality, around the table, 
and greeting. In the name of our Lord Jesus, we greet you. We got our right hand to offer to you. We got something a little extra. We saved up. We can, we can bless you too. We don't just need for ourselves. We can bless you as well. We want to be a church that says to the cities that we're in, we got our right hand and we're not afraid to use it. We're going to bless these cities. We're going to give money away to nonprofits. We're going to do good in Jesus' name. We got our right hand. I want to leave the church not just on the left hand, but on the right hand. This man in Mark 3, he ain't got no right hand. Now, you're looking at your Bible confused, and you're like, I don't see that detail anywhere. That's because you're in the wrong place. You've got to move over to Luke chapter 6. Do it now if you don't trust me. <laughs> Luke chapter 6, verse 6 tells us that this hand that was healed, that was withered, but then wasn't because he stretched it out when Jesus told him to, look at it on the screen. His right hand was the one afflicted. Why would Mark not tell us that? And Luke did. Mark's writing based on Peter's account. Peter didn't care about right hand, left hand. <laughs> Luke was a doctor. They're trained to take detailed notes of the patient's symptoms. I don't think he included it because he thought it was pertinent, spiritually speaking. I think he was just really used to it because maybe one time he accidentally amputated the wrong limb. <laughs> And he got to figure that out for the malpractice suits be coming. You know what I'm saying? Like, you got to write that. Right, right hand. <laughs> he had a bad experience. Yeah, I accidentally cut the wrong hand off that guy. It was terrible. Right? Once bitten, twice shy. So he writes down it was this man's right hand. Now that changes the game. Because it's bad enough to lose a hand. I've never had to deal with that, but I could imagine. But if I did lose one, I'd want to lose my left hand. Anybody with me on that? And some of you health pause are like, no. I'd want, to, I want to, I'd want to lose my non-dominant hand. Is that better? In that culture, that was the hand of the bathroom. There was no antibacterial wipes. You ate with your hands, ripping pita bread from the table, dipping it in the, the hummus, getting a little lamb meat to put on top of it. So the unclean hand that was used for your hygiene was always kept below the table. It was deep dishonor to use your left hand to shake someone's hand, to offer it in peace. This man had no right hand. I have a brother-in-law who's here. He was on stage a moment ago. His name is Brandon. He was born without a right hand. Jenny was the uh, one who caught him, bringing him into this world. It was a home birth. And she was the first to discover what the ultrasounds had missed, and that is that he didn't have a right hand. Now, people, as I've traveled the country with him and spent a lot of life with him, always are like, I'm so sorry, what happened? Uh, Well-intentioned Christians would be like, in Jesus' name, that hand's going to grow. <laughs> like, like the weirdest, the weirdest moments with him. Um, as though he was defective and not, this is how God built him. That's the assumption, oh, something's wrong. And it's been so fun for me. Well, not really fun because I'm so jealous, but um, to watch what could be described as a handicap be the exact opposite in every way possible, as he's never known life with, or life, life with a right hand. So all he's ever done is become capable and able and skilled with his left. And he's literally a Finnish carpenter. Imagine that. Uh, plays the guitar and the drums and can do anything. I anything you can do with two, he can do better, OK? <laughs> and I'm sick of it, all right? <laughs> but he was born that He literally doesn't know life with a right hand. But to have a right hand taken away would be different, which is this man's plight. Again, you're like, I don't know how you can be telling me that. None of the texts tell us. Was it Matthew? Was it Matthew's account in Matthew chapter 12, which the story also is in, as opposed to Luke chapter 6 or Mark chapter 3? No, it's in the Greek, which is a unique phrase in the Greek when describing the injury that describes something that occurred to him and not something that was congenital from birth. So either disease or injury, we don't know. But using our imagination, let's just go ahead and play it out. He's born with two hands, lives with two hands, is used to using his right hand to greet someone, to eat with someone, to give a gift to someone, or to bless the Lord. Raising a hand to God is intrinsic to how God created us to worship him, by the way. Some of you are confused at best, uncomfortable, perhaps, 
with sometimes the display of emotion you'll see in a gathering, especially if you come from a church tradition that thinks the way that God desires to be honored is with your hands in your pockets and a dull expression on your face. I can't find that psalm. I'm looking for it. I can't find it anywhere. Uh, where does it say, come church to church late, and then <laughs> having some fun, <laughs> shout unto God, clap your hands, all ye people. Not one, but two Hebrew words for praise that indicate praising God with hands being thrown up. So I throw up my praise you again. again. God intends for us to understand there's something that you need more than he does in raising up your hands to him. If you ever find yourself in a court of law about to give testimony, you will be told to what? Raise your right hand. Interesting. And for most of the history of the United States, it was also place your left hand on a Bible. Why? Your left hand's closest to your heart. Your right hand, a symbol of your authority, your integrity, your power. Right hand in the air, now swear. Comes from Genesis 14. When Abraham, who had been worshiping the gods that his pagan people worshipped, sex and money and drunkenness and whatever else, was called out by God. And God revealed himself to Abraham as the God who created heaven and earth. And Abraham raised his hand to the Lord who created him. Switching allegiance. There's something within that craves the raising up of hands. So this man had all that. He would raise his hands in synagogue as a little boy with his family. He would raise his hands to the, the God who made him. He would extend his right hand in greeting, in blessing, in gift giving, in eating, and then it was taken from him. Whether through an infection, I mean, something so small as a little cut without the right treatment can become a serious infection. You can claim your life. Could no doubt take a hand. Perhaps it was crushed. Stonework was by far more common than wood, which is why when you come on the incomparable cruise with us, we will show you cities from thousands of years ago. No one in 2,000 years is going to be cruising the ruins of America and pointing out the IKEA shelf that was located. <laughs> Where? Oh, attached to the MFD uh, prefabricated, built from sawdust. Is there any wood in that wood, right? But things built from stone last into the ages. That's why you get to walk around Israel and Greece and Rome and see what was there. And working with stone, as maybe this man did, Jesus probably did. I know it messes with your image of sawdust flying up because he was a carpenter. Go to Israel and tell me where all this wood is coming from. Most tectons, which is the Greek word for carpenter that you think is carpenter, woodworker, is actually stonemason, handyman. This is the guy you'd call when you need a coop for your chickens or a chair for, you know, the, the table, which, you know, he was, he was, he was a stoneworker who could just figure stuff out. That was Jesus. This guy probably, similar occupation, part of the vocational hazards of working with your hands is you could lose your fingers and as luck would have it, he lost not his left, but his right hand. And so instinctively, he would go to reach with his left and find people horrified. No longer able to work to supply, to take care of a family if he had one, or if he didn't, to attract a spouse, offering only his shriveled, atrophied right hand. And here's the mind-blowing part. I believe that from this day forward, this man would look back on that injury as one of the sweetest gifts of God's mercy he was ever given. And his claw of a hand for bones that can't be set with titanium pins and rods will eventually become a useless claw. That his season with that heavy burden was a delightful gift of God's providence and an unexpected measure of grace. It's funny how that can happen, isn't it? I have a friend named Fritz. Stuck out because it's 
It's my only one. <laughs> Named Fritz. And he has a son who's a prolific tennis player. I met him in Myrtle Beach. Daisy and I were preaching at a conference, and we had some rec time. So one day we rented a jet ski for an hour. He said, how long do you want it? Just an hour. Yeah, we can, we can give you a bargain on three hours. And I said, there's not fun you can have on a jet ski after an hour. <laughs> I said it tongue in cheek, but it's been my experience so far. Um, so uh, usually I'm good for about a year once I've had an hour on a jet ski. So <laughs> we did that. And then we saw there was a tennis facility near our hotel. So we walked over and we found out they, they had a pro there and he could, do, he could do tennis lessons. And at the time, the pro had uh, left the, uh, the area we were in. We couldn't get a tennis lesson, literally. Uh, and so it was like, we're excited. Let's get a tennis lesson for you, Daisy. And so we, we book him with this her with this nice old man named Hans, who's Fritz's uncle, who was teaching her. And it was great. And so I'm just chit-chatting with Fritz a little bit. And he says, oh, is this your only child? I go, no, we got five kids, one in heaven, four here on earth. And we talk for a while. And I said, do you have kids? He goes, oh, yeah, I got kids. And, and he shows me a picture of one of them. He says, in fact, he's one of the best junior tennis players in the entire country, my little guy. I think he was seven years old at the time. And I said, How'd that happen, right? And I assumed what was going to follow was going to be that story you hear about Andre Agassi and his dad out there, you know, when he was two, you know, t duct taping a tennis racket to his hand and not letting him come in until he had hit like 9,000 balls or whatever, you know, those, those stories you hear about the 10,000 hours that, that someone got. And, and he said, nothing could have prepared me for what he said. So how did your son become, his son's name Hudson, how did Hudson become the best junior tennis player, one of the best in the, in the whole country? And he said, it all started the day he broke his right hand. Do tell more. <laughs> and he did. Apparently, there was a tournament. And he was killing time between matches. And they had a van loaded up with their bicycles and stuff so that during the tournament, they could play and you know, explore and go eat or whatever. And his son said, there's a skate park you can bike in right across the street from the tennis facility. Can I go ride my bike around the rims? He said, absolutely. Go for it. Go nuts. And, and, and the son did. And he went off a jump. And he fell off. And he broke his right hand. Here's a photo of him they took in the hospital uh, that shows the, the bones that are broken. Here he is in, in incredible agony. And the next morning after surgery, gets this all set, gets this all sorted out. It's all dawning on them. He's a right-handed tennis player who is traveling around playing tennis at the high level uh, at the age of seven. And he, his dad said, well, well, you know what are we going to do now? And, and Hudson's like, I'm going to go play tennis. He goes, you, you, you can't play tennis. Your arm's in a sling. He goes, I got two hands, dad. <laughs> I got two hands, dad. He said, but that's not your dominant hand. You, you, don't, you know how that works. You don't just randomly do, do that. And he says, I'll figure it out. So his dad takes him outside and starts feeding him ball after ball after ball. And you can see in the video clip that he sent me. <laughs> Literally day after surgery. Come on, let's hear it for Hudson, this little <laughs> legend. So. In tennis, you have a forehand, which is almost always with a one hand. And then you have a, a backhand, which is almost always with two. But the, the reality is a backhand is just a left-handed forehand. The other hand is just there for guidance. All the actual power and strength comes from a left hand. And most tennis players have a weaker backhand than a forehand. So the strategy is usually send the ball to their backhand, higher probability that they'll miss. But because he now had to learn how to hit a forehand with his non-dominant hand, once he was able to add the right hand to it and hit his normal backhand, it had become a dominant shot for him. But he still also had his forehand. And now he also had a wicked strong backhand. So today, Hudson is one of the best nine-year-old tennis players in the United States of America. Why? Because of something terrible that happened to his right hand. Come on, somebody. I came to encourage someone who today feels like because of this injury, because of this loss, because of this pain, because of this grief, I could never. Life's over. There's no more hope. And what I came to tell you is it ain't over till he says it's over. So just keep showing up. That's the first of three things you got to do if you need your right hand healed. You got to show up. You got to step forward. And you got to stretch out. Come on, say it with me. You got to show up, you got to step forward, and you got to stretch out. You got to show up, 
You got to step forward and you need to stretch out. Anybody with me? Yeah. Okay. Show it to me in the text, Levi. Happy to. The text says Jesus being in the synagogue on the Sabbath day again. again. You hear it? Jesus being in the synagogue on the Sabbath day. One text tells us that Jesus, when he went to church, he was doing what he had been doing since early days. What you do when you're young matters. And you, people talk bad about the ruts you can get stuck in, stuck in a rut, going through the motions. Hey, it ain't all terrible if they're the right motions. Right. Savings is a motion, just as spending is. Tithing is a motion, just as not tithing is. It, reading your scripture and Bible in the morning, hiding it in your heart, just as scrolling Instagram mindlessly or TikTok mindlessly is a routine, is a rut. Jesus, raised by Mary and Joseph, didn't ask the question, are we going to church today? It was the ha he was a creature of habit. And so it could be counter. It's funny, so many people, when you read the scripture, like, it's crazy. Jesus keeps healing people in the Sabbath uh, synagogue on Sabbath days. I think they figured it out. <laughs> God, I wish I could get a miracle. Where is Jesus at? Well, you know, I'm not the brightest tool in the box, but we can figure out, like, this is what he keeps doing. We can show up where he's going to be. Yeah. But we get no indication that that was the case for this man. There's, there's no... Uh, detail in the story that tells us this man seemed to think today he was, he was the most confused of anybody this was all happening. Why was this guy in the synagogue on the Sabbath day? Because he knows or knew what you and I need to know. There's power simply in showing up. Would it be easy for him to go, how could, how, how, first of all, why would I even show up? Remember what Job's friends told him? Bro, you must have done something real bad to deserve all this. Remember his wife? Bro, you should just curse God and die. What Job do? His kids having just been killed, lost every penny he had to his name. His health afflicted. He drops to his knees and says, you give God and you take away. You have left hand days for me and you have right hand days for me, but I'm going to take them both and raise them to you. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And this man with a withered hand, it would be so much easier for him just to stay home. You think? Just forget about it is showing up to worship. He's not drawing attention to himself. He doesn't, you don't see him doing what blind Bartimaeus did. Jesus, Jesus, come heal me. I need you. I need you. This, I'm not saying it's bad for Bartimaeus. I'm saying this guy's just in the back. He's just there to worship. He's just there to bless God. On a good day, on a bad day, I'm, he's saying, I'm a child of God. I'm here to give God glory. And this encounter happened, I believe, not just because of what happened on this day, but what happened on the days where this didn't happen, too. He was developing the muscles of faith. He was training for trials he wasn't yet in. So first step in receiving whatever God has for your right hand is you just got to show up. One of the problems with missing church is eventually you stop missing church. And a symptom of not being in the presence of God is not missing and longing for the presence of God. The more you experience his presence, the more you long to experience his presence, and the more there is to see in his presence. But pull yourself away from it. It puts you into a dim environment. And you always look better in a dim environment. That's why we scatter like cockroaches when the lights come on in the movie theater, because we finally realize what we've been luxuriating in. We're like, oh my god, it's filthy in here. <laughs> Get me out of here. The longer you're out of scripture, the longer you're out of church, the more the lights get dim. You start to look pretty good, feel pretty good. I'm doing pretty good. I'm, life's pretty good. It ain't nothing without the presence of God, without his glory, without him shining his life and heart on you, without him manifesting his presence in the midst of his people as we exalt his name, which is how he has appointed for us to praise him together. This man showed up. Secondly, when Jesus called him to, what did he do? He stepped forward. 
Well, that's scary. Jesus singles him out. He's in the back of the room somewhere against the wall. And Jesus says, step forward. He's like, you're talking, he, I think he's talking about you. He's, you know what I'm saying? Like, no one wants to be singled out in that way. There's something within us that, that, that wants to preserve our image of cool. I remember when the, the altar call came for me to get saved. I was already going to church, but it was time for me to come and respond. And everything in my, in my head was just saying, if you come and give your life to Christ today, everyone around you is going to think, wait, he, he's a fake because he's already been coming, but isn't really saved. And I was just, then God was like, hey, uh, idiot, none of their opinions matter, just mine. And I want you. The times I've responded to invitations to come because I sense God pulled to ministry or sense my need for him in some unique way, there's always a voice in my head saying, stay back here, stay back here, stay back here. The power comes when you step forward. Though none go with me, so I will follow. No turning back, no turning back. So this is the faith of this man who not only had shown up, but now stepped forward. And then Jesus, he said, what did he say? Stretch out your hand. Oh, boy. He had perhaps kept this, kept this thing out of sight for so long because no one wanted to look at it. And he got sick of explaining. Now, with every eye on him, he has to Expose his claw. John Ortberg said that you can take your shame and either experience healing or keep it hidden, but never both. The power comes not when we just have gone to God for forgiveness, but to each other for healing. And people can't love, the body of Christ cannot love and heal who you wish you were. Just who you really are. So the boldness it takes to say, I got a broken right hand. I got a withered hand. And then the courage to be a church community that will see someone struggling and not point the fingers but circle up with a hug and say, we're going to pray you to wholeness. I got my own withered hand. Here's what God's done for me. He's going to work in your life. I'm not scared of your withered hand. I'm not embarrassed by your withered hand. I'm not, I'm not insulted or disgusted because I'm no better than you. But he's better than all of us, and he still loves us. So the man did the three things. He, 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 he showed up. He, he stepped forward. And, and then when Jesus called him to, he, he stretched out his hand. And none of those things are my sermon. Because this message is not about this man. It's about the Pharisees. Who, looking on, were so sick that they could watch a man be given his right hand back. Prospects for marriage just opened up. Ability to provide for his family. Everything is now changed. He can now have meals and eat his own food and not get insulted, insulting gross looks from people. He was just given his right hand back. And they're mad because it happened on a Sunday, a Saturday, the order in which it took place. In fact, I would suggest that this is not the story of a man with a withered hand. It's a story of the men with the withered hands. And maybe that's why it's one of the few details in Scripture that are included in three of the four Gospels. There's multiple withered hands here. Not this guy's only, but the other men and, and, and individuals that day who had some right hands that had withered up on their own. How does this happen? Well, let me tell you about the Pharisees in particular. This is a sect of Judaism that developed during the Babylonian captivity, when Israel, through their sin and dis disobedience to God concerning the Sabbath, concerning divorce, concerning tithing, concerning lots of different idols that they were worshiping, money, sex, usually time. These are all kind of the usual suspects. Why doesn't the devil get more creative? Well, when you go fishing, do you change bait while the fish are biting? The devil would move on if you'd quit eating it. So during this time, there was a spiritual renewal as people were like, gosh, we got to quit it. We got to stop. Let's long for revival. Let's pray for revival. And guess what? It happened. You're welcome, God said. 
the Pharisees were born. I know when we talk about the Pharisees, we hear the Darth Vader theme song in our head. Dun, 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 right? Hold on. This started as full-on revival. We don't want to be treacherous with our wives. Let's honor our marriage fast. Good thing, bad thing. Right hand. God, we want to honor you with the tithe. Good thing, bad thing. God, we want to influence our culture. We want to tell them we can stay pure in Babylon. We, when we come back to the Holy Land, we want to listen to what Nehemiah said, and that is honor the Sabbath. But it became twisted. It became twist. The right, the, the right hand can become twisted. How? When it goes to your head and you're not focusing attention back on Jesus, who is the head of the church. The moment a blessing doesn't get turned to praise, it becomes an idol in the heart and a twisting of the hand. How do we fight against this constantly with these four things? Honesty, humility, vulnerability, and authority. If you got a right hand today, you need to foster honesty with yourself and with others and with God, humility about how the right hand came to you, vulnerability with each other about what's the struggle and the temptation, and then lastly, authority, meaning we keep doing the things that God calls us to do, and we never think we're above it because we're at a different season. We graduated past that. <laughs> The moment your right hand stops being lifted in praise, humility, vulnerability, honesty, under God's authority, you have a hand that's beginning to twist and wither and pollute. Woe to those, Isaiah said, Isaiah 521, who are wise in their own eyes. Jeremiah chapter 9, verse 23, let not the wise man glory in his wisdom. Let not the, the, what's the text say? Not the mighty man glory in his might. Let not the rich man, let not the right-handed man glory in his right hand. You see? But let him who glories glory in this, that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord exercising loving kindness, judgment, and righteousness in the earth. For in these I delight, says the Lord. You got a God who took your left hand when no one else would. He held you with his mighty right arm when no one else would. He died on the cross for you. He gives you your life back, gives you your soul back, gives you a future and then you go out and start doing good with your right hand now because he healed it. But the moment you take your eyes off of him and think of your soccer or your business or your social media empire, or your clout that now's coming, all the doors are opening for you. The moment you think that's for you and it's gone to your head and your eyes are not on the head of the church, Jesus, your hand is withering. And you become, you, you end up like the Pharisees, so perverted that they rush out of this gathering, huddle up with their enemies, the Herodians, and plan out how they can kill Jesus. He's awful. Why? Heal that guy. Remember Jesus' question? Is it right to take life or save it on the Sabbath? Who worked harder on that Sabbath day? Jesus, who just went, put your hand out. Poof, what do you need? Healed. Did he work, did he work up a sweat? They're now in a business meeting at the Sheraton Hotel in the conference room, planning the crucifixion of Jesus, which is far more a violation of their own principles So my right-handed people, what's the prayer? You, you promised a prayer. Didn't you promise a prayer? I promised a prayer. I did promise a prayer. Here it is. Put my title back up on the screen. You pray, you pray when you got a right hand is, I can't handle this. 
See what I did there? Because you've had it the whole time. I can't handle it. So, Father, we say what this man should have said, the enemy who was mocking you and trying to bait you into a trap. He was at a place at some point along the way of strength, and he should have said, I can't handle this, so I give it to you. But instead, it went to his head, and we don't want that to happen, God. We want to give the glory to you, to you, Jesus, unto the Lamb, the head of the church. So instead of it going to our head, we bring that praise and bring it to you who are the head. If you would say today, I needed this message because I needed to remember to give God my capabilities to, not just my insecurities, could I ask that across the church, church online, every location, you would raise up your right hand to God? Raise up your right hand to God. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Don't take your heavy hand from us, God. We wouldn't make it without you. We would mess it up without you. Now, come on, someone's struggling today with insecurities. Go ahead and raise up that left hand today. You're hanging by a thread today. I promise there will be something for you today. If you're, if you're at a place where you're like, my bandwidth is exceeded, get that left hand in the air. We're safer here with our hands raised. We're safer here. Thank you, God. Thank you that you put your hand, your right hand, not just on the firstborn, Manasseh. You, put it, you cross your arms to put your right hand on, on Ephraim. So you put your hands on us today. We're not that firstborn. We're not, we don't have it all together, but... But thank you for putting your right hand on us, God, and blessing us. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord.